What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey, how you doing? For today's video, I am fangirling slightly because I am chatting to another absolute classics giant in my industry. So today I'm speaking to Professor Barry Strauss of Cornell University and we're going to specifically be talking about this book sitting right next to me that is The Death of Caesar. So even though today we're going to be discussing this, you're probably also familiar with Professor Strauss's other publications including Salamis from 2004, which, fun fact, Professor Strauss is an honorary citizen of Salamis in Greece, which is incredibly exciting but also his most recent publication, which is titled The War That Made the Roman Empire, which you guys can now find in all major bookshops. And also, obviously, the books that I have just mentioned are linked below. So today we're going to be getting into Caesar, but first and foremost, the way that I like to start all of these interviews is actually by asking you about your classics background. So I think that context is very important. So how did you get into classics? How did you discover it? And how did it end with you being you know, a professor at an Ivy League university, publishing multiple books, being awarded super high honors by the country of Greece? You know, what does that journey look like to us? Almost by accident. Uh, I knew that I wanted to study languages and uh, I didn't have a chance to study uh, Greek or Latin in high school. Uh, when I got to college, two things happened. First, I read Thucydides in a, just an introduction to European history course. And second, I saw that there was a possibility of taking ancient Greek in what was then called the Greek civilization program. So I thought this just sounded great. And I love Thucydides. I thought he just was really insightful and brilliant. So that's how it all started. And I got hooked on Plato and Homer, all the classics decided to do Latin as well. I thought I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. That was my original plan. And I actually got a summer internship as a newspaper reporter for a good suburb, big suburban daily uh, and realized I just wasn't cut out for that. So I decided to go with plan B, which was to get a PhD in ancient history. And that's what I did. And I never really looked back. That's a very bold plan B. PhD is the plan B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess so. So you are an expert in, as you sort of alluded to there, um, ancient military strategy. So I was wondering what drew you to that? And more specifically, because you just mentioned Thucydides, you know, what was it about military escapades that drew you in? Oh, that's a really good question. I think that probably a lot of guys of my generation, so baby boomers who didn't go to Vietnam, and I was just young enough that it really wasn't a threat maybe a little bit at one point, but then we realized the draft was going to be over. We we're not going to be drafted. But my father and grandfather had fought in the world wars and kind of, I was sort of interested in military things and maybe partly as a compensation, what can I say? But also just because I thought the whole subject was fascinating. I got drawn into it. I also had excellent teachers who made it seem like an exciting and important subject. And I think the personal connection really does explain a lot of the things that we do in life so the book that we are going to be discussing today, though, is The Death of Caesar, which I absolutely plowed through. I thought it was so well done. I mean, it was just such a riveting read. Uh, so I was wondering, this is a very niche book, obviously. This is just about one day and the build up to the day and then the, the aftermath of the day as well. So what was it that made you want to write this particular book as opposed to for example you know you have other books about the caesars in general but not just julius caesar okay so a couple of things uh first of all it's worth pointing out that in the u.s until recently maybe it's still the case i don't know pretty much every student would read uh shakespeare's tragedy of julius caesar it was absolutely fundamental to the curriculum and i think it has it goes all the way back to the american revolution and pardon me for saying, but the idea that George III was a tyrant, we know he wasn't, uh, but that's what Americans were raised on. And so the tragedy of Julius Caesar seemed like somehow a metaphor for the United States. So it was in my mind, it was in other people's minds. Um, secondly, I wrote a book on Spartacus and got interested in gladiators. And um, I noticed this little detail I hadn't really noticed before, that gladiators were involved in the Ides of March. And I thought, wow, what's that all about? Um, so I decided to follow that thread. And 
it occurred to me that there was an untold story there. Of course, there's been so much scholarship done on the subject. How can any um, path have been left untrodden? But but I think there was, maybe not so much with the gladiators as with the person who employed the gla gladiators, uh, the forgotten assassin, Decimus Brutus. So that's what got me into the story. Also, frankly, I had fallen in love with Rome. It was a reason to be in Rome. I got to spend a lot of time in Rome researching the book, and uh, that's pretty much the genesis of it. So how much of this particular incident did you know prior to writing the book then if you followed that thread or was it more so a case of like learning on the job basically it was more of a case of learning on the job of course i knew something about it um after all i studied roman history but i didn't know it in detail so i had to learn about it in detail which i thoroughly enjoyed doing and the source that you use we have to talk about the source because this was the first time I was opened up to Nicholas of Dam Damascus. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. So do you want to tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, he's a fascinating, if lesser known person. He wrote voluminously and unfortunately very little of his work survives, but he was a Greek from Damascus and he was something like the Zelig of this period of ancient history. Uh, he served as a, uh, an advisor to uh, the infamous King Herod of Judea. Uh, it was a very important person, both in the court of Herod and in the court of Herod's son, Archelaus. Um, he also had served as tutor to Antony and Cleopatra's children in Alexandria, uh, and finally end up, ended up in Rome uh, in the entourage of Augustus. Uh, and he wrote a history of Herod. Uh, he also wrote a history of of the Caesars, as it were, and and in particular a life of Julius Caesar. And, and very little of this survives. But fortunately for me, one of the parts that does survive has to do with uh, Caesar's assassination, and it presents a different story than we get from uh, our other main sources: uh, Suetonius, Plutarch. Uh, the letters of Cicero, uh, a few tidbits here and there, and some of the other later sources like uh, Erosius, um, and so on and so forth. So fascinating work, absolutely fascinating work. Fortunately for me, um, an excellent scholar, uh, uh, Professor Mark Torer, was writing a book about uh, Nicholas of Damascus and a commentary on uh, these very passages uh, as well as others and he was kind enough to share unpublished material with me uh, that was uh, tremendously important and valuable in my work so that's kind of a fun tag team then going on there yes absolutely lucky me but i've always depended on the work of other scholars i think all of us who do classics do we do depend on other scholars and i've off often found that reaching out to people personally makes a big difference and people will say things in person that they might not say in print uh, that gives you the backstory that's so often more valuable in some ways than what they have in print. Absolutely. And going into this backstory, you know, obviously the, the bone of this whole story is the conspirators, right? So the, the huge group of conspirators that decide that Caesar needs to die. So I think the question that everybody wants to ask, and so the question I'm going to ask you is, as a broad brushstroke, because obviously this is a very difficult question, but as a broad brushstroke, what is the reason for why so many people wanted Caesar done? That's a really good question. I think there are probably three main reasons. First of all, some wanted revenge because they had supported Pompey in the Civil War. Um, some feared with some evidence that he was on his way to becoming uh, a tyrant or at least dictator for life and that he was going to change the Roman, the political system of the Roman Republic. And some felt that they had been betrayed by him, that they had supported him, but now they were being shut out uh, of the, uh, the political arrangements that he was making. So I think those were the reasons, um, those were the main reasons why they wanted to uh, kill him. And something that really intrigued me about your book was the section where you were discussing why the Ides of March was so important. I think I just, I had never really focused on that before. And part of me was kind of thinking, you know, oh, they're probably planning for a Tuesday, but if it doesn't work, I'll go for <laughs> Thursday, you know, it's no big deal. 
But this was really important to focus on the 15th of March. So do you want to explain why that was? Well, sure. Um, first of all, it, it was a minor Roman religious festival. Uh, it was a spring festival. Um, it also was the informal mark of the campaigning season. And the conspirators knew that there would be a lot of people would not actually be in Rome that day, but rather they would be uh, on the outskirts of the city celebrating the festival. So that was very useful for them. Secondly, in a way, it was their last chance because Caesar was about to leave for this extremely ambitious campaign that would take him to the east for several years. So if they wanted to kill him, they had to kill him on that day. And third, they were determined to uh, kill him at a meeting of the Senate and to kill him in person. They could have hired thugs to carry out the assassination. Uh, this is, after all, what had been done to Clodius a few years earlier. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted to kill him in person. And the reason is that they believe that Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, had become too big for his britches or his toga, and, they had and that he had been assassinated by a group of senators at a meeting of the Senate. And so they wanted to engage in what they saw as this very Roman, this very traditional uh, act that would justify the act in the eyes of the public, that just as their ancestors had killed Romulus, so they would kill Caesar in what would be read by the public not as an, a shabby act of revenge done for personal motives, but as an act of patriotism done according to the ways the mores of the Roman constitution and, and Roman ancestors. So a meeting in the Ides of March in the Senate House would be the way to get this message across. It was all about messaging, as well as the, the actual logistics of carrying out an assassination. No small thing. You said that, that it was like a really Roman thing, right? So this had happened throughout history. And there was another instance that you mentioned of assassination. I wrote this down because I knew I would forget the date. But 47 BC, uh, there was another attempted assassination. Didn't actually happen in further Spain. Uh, but there was the illusion that these conspirators have sort of taken that model as well and sort of just done kind of the same thing. But Caesar seemingly, I could have read this completely wrong, he seemed like he thought he was a bit invincible, that this wasn't going to happen, he wasn't really taking the threats, the plots, plots of assassination seriously. But if this had happened before, why wouldn't he? That's a really good question. So I think there are a couple of reasons. I think you're right that Caesar didn't take this all that seriously. For one thing, there's the matter of noise, as they say in the intelligence business. Uh, probably there were new, there were rumors of plots that came in every single day. And I think Caesar just got inured to it and thought, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I've heard this before. Uh, secondly, Caesar was a cynic and he felt, who would be crazy enough to kill me? Because killing me will be the signal of starting another civil war. We've just had a terrible civil war. Who would be crazy enough to want to plunge Rome into another civil war? Um, and uh, uh, third, uh, Caesar was arrogant. But there's another issue. Caesar was a soldier. He was a military man. And he was macho. And I think he felt it's beneath my dignity to put on uh, armor a breastplate, a bulletproof vest, as it was in, in Rome. He's also a member of the Roman nobility. Caesar is a, a nobilis, nobilis uh, through and through. And I think he feels it is beneath my dignity as a Roman noble to show fear about an assassination. I am the consul. Who is going to assassinate me? I, I think that's part of it. I think that's a really big part of it that we... We, we ignore at our peril. So fast forwarding a little bit, because you mentioned Shakespeare earlier, and I just thought of this, uh, that we get to the day, we get to the Ides of March, this thing pans out. By the way, that story of how it actually unfolds is wild. You guys should just buy the book and read that of like how Caesar wasn't gonna go to the Senate and they sent Decimus to go and get him. It was this telenovela moment. But back to Shakespeare. Uh, there's that famous line from Shakespeare that when he's you know, getting killed, he says, et tu, Brute. And that's not real, that's not factual. 
but there was thoughts that it possibly stemmed from something he might have said. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Sure. So et tu brute was invented in the Renaissance, not by Shakespeare, but by an earlier writer. So Shakespeare's using that. So the, the two sources that discuss this say there's a rumor that Caesar said something, but we don't believe he said something. We think he just groaned. Um, but what the rumor was, was that he said something similar to et tu brute, but not in Latin in Greek. He said, kai su paideon, uh, which means you too, child, you too, little boy. So what does this mean? Well, um, scholars have talked about this. Uh, some think that uh, it's a a quotation from a line of a now missing Greek tragedy, which says, in effect, you two child, so someday suffer a fate like this. Uh, and we know that Roman nobles would quote Greek the way, say, uh, a 19th century Russian aristocrat would quote French, um, just to show off their erudition. Uh, secondly, Kaisu is a typical phrase in a curse tablet. Uh, and it means something same to you. Um, and second thought is that Caesar is uh, mimicking the phraseology of a curse tablet. He's cursing Brutus. The third uh, theory, which is the juiciest, is that it's not that at all. But Caesar is referring to the well-known rumor that Brutus was his illegitimate son. Now, everybody knew that Caesar, as a young man, had had an affair with Brutus's mother, Servilia. Uh, and this was also known that she was the greatest love of Caesar's love life, which is saying something because he'd had a lot of loves. But Servilia was supposed to be his, his favorite. Uh, and there was a rumor that indeed that Brutus was the, the love child of this relationship. At the time, Caesar was 15 when Brutus was born. Uh, is it possible that Caesar was the father? It's unlikely given the age, but frankly, they started young in Rome and it's not completely impossible. So the third theory, which is the one that appealed to George Bernard Shaw, by the way, is that Caesar was saying to Brutus, you know what? It's true. You really are my son and you have just murdered your father. And parricide is the most heinous crime in Rome. So have a nice day. Was it possible that he could have been saying that just like as a joke, as like a last line, he knows he's dying. So he went, screw it, I'm going to throw this out and see how it goes. Well, anything's possible, but it seems pretty unlikely if you were reali realizing that you're being assassinated, you're being attacked right and left by conspirators, you're fighting for your life, you're a soldier, your adrenaline is going wild. The thought that you would suddenly stop and say something that would sound funny witty in a gentleman's club i doubt it <laughs> i would love that that's something that i want to be able to say if that happens to me like you've got to be that quick <laughs> you know uh the, the, the french say um l'esprit d'escalier you know staircase wisdom the thing you think of as you're leaving going down the staircase if only uh it were true i, I think it's really unlikely uh and so do the ancient sources but if only so after Caesar is killed though, right? We're not gonna to spend too much time talking about Caesar's death because I think everybody can guess based on the title of the book that he dies. There's nothing really to divulge there. Read the book if you would like the details of all of that. Uh, but after that, I had what might be a stupid question. So bear with me. Uh, but it's a question about, because after Caesar's killed, there are lots of riots that come out, you know, all around Rome. People are, are trying to figure out what's going on. And the conspirators of the senators are trying to figure out what to tell the public. So something that you wrote was that if Caesar was declared by them as a tyrant, then his administrative arrangements around the empire would be null and void. So I was wondering why him being labeled as a tyrant then meant that his stuff would then be null and void. Like what's the connection there? Well, it would mean that what he had done was illegitimate and it wasn't, you know, according to the to the Roman Constitution. I mean, they could only go so far in in their criticism of, of Caesar. If they said, you know, everything he did was bad because this man is a tyrant, then the logical next step is to render what he did null and void and start over again. 
but they didn't want to do i mean it wouldn't automatically it's not automatic that he's a tyrant so his the things that he's done aren't good but if if he is a tyrant uh and the senate is meeting to decide what to do then the logical thing is to say well then we don't accept his decisions we don't accept the things that he has enacted we must revisit them all and they didn't want to do that because they actually had benefited from some of these decisions they had been given public offices and they didn't want to lose those public offices so they were hypocritical in, in what they did they could only go so far would that also again this might be a stupid question but would that also then impact like the building structures that he uh, funded and he planned as well like if he were to be labeled a tyrant would those have stopped being made would those have been torn down or would it not go that far it was just administrative stuff well no i don't think they would have done that if the conspirators if the assassins had won in the civil war uh then they might have taken something like caesar's forum and say this is no longer the forum of julius this is no longer the julian forum uh they might have rebranded it as something else they might have turned it into uh the forum of libertas you know uh, they certainly would have taken down the statue of Cleopatra, uh, especially if she really was holding her infant son, Caesarian, in the statue. Um, they would have rebranded that. The Senate House would not have been known as the Curia Julia, the Julian Senate House. Um, they would have given it a different name. But, you know, tearing down buildings given ancient technology is no s small thing. It's a difficult thing and, and very, very expensive. It would be a waste of all that labor that had been done. So I don't think they would have done that. Again, none of these things would be automatic if you call them a tyrant, but I think they would just be the logical uh, consequence of going that far. Now, you mentioned Cleopatra there because uh, she was in in Rome at the time and she hung around afterwards, didn't she, as well? Uh, can you explain why it was in her interest to hang around in Rome after Caesar's died? Okay. So Caesar is Cleopatra's mistress. She is almost certainly the mother of his son, Caesarian. Um, and at the time of his death, the, if we understand Caesar correctly, she was pregnant by Caesar and then has a miscarriage. Um, but she's also the queen of Egypt. And uh, Egypt is a client state of Rome, which is always hanging on to its independence by a thread. And she is uh, an excellent diplomat who is fighting for her for her kingdom she wants to find out who is going to be running rome and who she in a sense is going to have to report to or fight against in the next phase so devastated she as she might have been individually and as a lover uh as the queen of egypt it's her responsibility to find out what's going to happen in rome um, so she wants to hang around for a bit Besides which, it might not be so easy to leave on a moment's notice, although I suppose she could if her life depended on it. So another person who is affected, shall we say, by Caesar's death, and that is certainly underplaying what I'm about to say, is Octavian, who then ultimately becomes Augustus. Am I correct in thinking that he was advised, though, not to take the adoption status? Yes, yes. So... Um... Caesar announced in his will that he was going to adopt Octavian as his, his son. This was illegal according to Roman law. There's no such thing as posthumous adoption. But that wasn't the main problem facing Octavian. The main problem facing Octavian was that Caesar had been assassinated and there was a target on the head of Caesar's family. I think that Caesar's mother and his stepfather excuse me, Octavian's mother and his stepfather feared that uh, were Octavian to accept this adoption, uh, that there'd be a target on his head as well. If his name was Gaius Octavius, if his name became Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, then his life might not be all that uh, safe anymore. I think that was their concern. And he doesn't accept their advice. He decides to throw the dice and to and to go for it. Eventually, when he has power within a year or so, he gets, uh, uh, I forget if it's the Senate or one of the assemblies, to legally approve this adoption. So now 
he's gone through more or less the official channels of being adopted in Rome, even though it's still a little questionable because the adopter is supposed to be alive. But he's not quite as illegal and illegitimate as he had been before. Now, Caesar is such a fascinating man. And, like, I mean, just when, if you guys haven't read the ancient source material, it's just kind of fascinating. I mean, okay, I said that and then immediately thought of De Bello Gallico and translating that and that's not the most thrilling of books. Uh, but <laughs> if you read any of the other texts about Caesar, he's just an incredible person. And he then leaves everything to Augustus, who ends up being also a really great leader. And I was wondering, as somebody who's an expert in military strategy, again, a very broad question requiring a very broad answer. What do you think made these two men so great? And maybe did Caesar see something in Augustus? Or because he had Antony, he could have left everything to Antony or you know, whoever. So what was it about Caesar that made him great? And then how did he then see, you know, Octavian as being so great? They were both, uh, you know, ambitious to the nth degree, and they were both brilliant. They were extremely, extremely intelligent people. Uh, and they also each had the ability to size up things um, uh, in a moment. Uh, they had this uh, uh, ability in the flash of an eye, the wink of an eye to uh, size up a situation. Uh, Caesar was personally very courageous. He was a great battlefield leader and he was a great speaker. Um, he also was a master of speed. Um, and uh, he was a risk addict. He loved taking risks. And eventually, you know, he paid for it with his life. But gen generally, he, um, uh, he was a man who understood the value of strategic risk taking. Uh, he wouldn't just take any old risk, but he would think about uh, what's the wisest thing strategically to do. And sometimes he would um, avoid taking tactical risks that didn't serve a strategic purpose. I should also add that um, he was an expert diplomat, extremely cunning, uh, a fabulous speaker, uh, had a real sense of his own destiny. And finally, he was a great writer. You know, De Bello Gallico is not always the most fascinating books, but some of it is just brilliant. And the propaganda of something like the Battle of the Sabbath in book two, it just floors me um, how well it is written and, and how carefully the propaganda is, uh, is crafted and aimed at the audience. Uh, Octavian was different in some ways. He was not a great battlefield leader. He wasn't a coward, but he didn't have Caesar's panache on the battlefield. I don't think he understood war instinctively the way Caesar did. Caesar was a military hero. You know, at a very early age, he won, he won the second highest honor that the Roman state had to bestow because he saved the, saved the life of a citizen in fighting. Even when he was a young man, the guy's 19, he walks into a Senate meeting and everybody has to stand up to recognize him. That could go to a fellow's head uh, to have this sort of honor. Octavian didn't have anything like that. But what he did have was that he was Caesar's grandnephew. He was the son of Caesar's sister's uh, daughter. Um, so he was a, a member of the, uh, the Julian clan on his mother's side. On his father's side, he was not so special, minor figure in um, the Roman elite and equestrian, barely a, a, a senatorial family. Um, self, his father is not a self-made man, but some of his ancestors probably were. They didn't come from Rome. They came from a city 25 miles away from Rome. But um, his mother and his grandmother, Caesar's sister, really took this kid on uh, and they brought him to Caesar's attention. Caesar didn't have a legitimate son of his own. He had a daughter who he loved, but she died in childbirth in uh, 10 years or so before Caesar's assassination. And so Caesar takes on the boy Octavian. He has several other, Caesar has several other not very distant relatives as well, young men, but none of them is as promising as Octavian. And what he sees is that Octavian has the intelligence and he has the ambition, he has the X factor. He is cunning and ruthless. He can see through people. Um, he can sift and decide what to do. Nothing, he is unstoppable. And Caesar sees this. He sees these qualities of a guy. I think we don't really know, but that's what we think. And so um, six months or so before his assassinated, Caesar changes his will. And he names Octavian as his heir. Um, 
I think, because he sees what. So he doesn't plan to die. Although it must be said, Caesar was not an entirely healthy man. He was suffering either from epilepsy or perhaps more likely through a series of mini strokes, perhaps from an accident that he had had while fighting in Spain some years earlier. We don't know how many years earlier, because he was in Spain on several occasions in different points of his life. Um, but he was not entirely healthy in the last year of his life. There were some incidents, uh, embarrassing incidents in public. And it might have occurred to him, I'm not going to live forever. And I better have the right person to, uh, to replace me on the throne. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize outside of epilepsy, there was also like the possibility of mini strokes or something else that was going on there. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. There, um, um, I worked with um, uh, a, neuro a neurologist when I wrote the book to get his take on it. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, uh, who's also an MD, PhD, afterwards wrote a book on Caesar's disease. Uh, we came to similar conclusions. I, I have no medical background, so mine is based on what the neurologist suggested. Um, uh, my colleague has much better knowledge of these things. And uh, he suggested also a series of, of mini strokes. Um, so I doubt that Caesar thought he was going to die right away. I mean, he's going off on this campaign in the East, like, like many people. I think he was probably in denial and perhaps didn't know how serious his condition was. It's hard to say. But certainly it occurred to him, you need to plan for the future. And this is a lesson that Augustus understood very, very well. Uh, in his own lifetime, uh, because he put huge effort into the succession. And one of the reasons for the success of Augustus and his dynasty uh, is precisely because he was utterly ruthless in making sure that he had a worthy successor. And in the end, he's forced to accept someone he doesn't even like, uh, Tiberius, because he knows the guy can do the job. And, and many a you know, many a ruler has, uh, his dynasty has failed after him because he, he didn't make the right choices that, that Augustus made. So the other difference between, I'd say, uh, Augustus Octavian and Julius Caesar is that, as I said, uh, Octavian's not a great military leader. He's not a battlefield commander at all. But one of the things that makes him great is that he knows himself and he knows his own limitations. And so he gets a series of partners who can carry out the military task. And the most important, most famous of them is Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, a, a boyhood friend uh, who is also a great general and a great admiral uh, and plays a very major role in Caesar's success, Octavian's success. So much more than his great uncle, he understood the importance of holding in your ego and working with an, a good number two. So just based on everything that you've said, I'm just curious, what's like your favorite fun fact that when people are like, oh, it's a fun fact about Caesar or about Augustus or, you know, one of those, it's like your favorite one to tell people to kind of like pique their interest. Ooh, uh, that's a good one. I think with, with Augustus is that for all his egotism, he knew his limitations and he understood um, the importance of knowing that. And he was a really great politician finding people who could work with him. Again, the man had an ego a mile high, but in spite of that, he understood um, that he had to depend on others. He made mistakes, he really did, but, but it's remarkable how good he was at balancing the ego side and the humility side. It's so important for being a great leader. For Caesar, you know, I just think the fact that he's a triple threat that the guy is a great commander, a great politician, and a great writer. Uh, the fact that there was so much genius in one person, uh, uh, that doesn't mean he was a good guy. In many ways, he was a very evil man. I mean, think of all the people he killed, and think of the, the act of naked aggression that his conquest of Gaul was, and the lack of respect, I think, in many ways that he had for the Roman Republic. I mean, there are there are other scholars who who think he was more of a small R Republican than many of us give him credit for. But he's just a swashbuckling genius in, in so many different ways. It's uh, it's hard not to uh, both be in awe of him and be appalled by him at the same time. He's just so reminiscent of so many 
captains of industry or politicians who are swaggering and think they are larger than life and sometimes they really are and yet at the same time they can horrify us as well and that's what caesar and caesarism is all about well, that was a really great serious answer but my answer for the caesar one is uh his story of going to is it bithynia where there's that king and then all of the graffiti was that Bith is his name Nic Nicomedes? Wasn't that his name? Nicomedes, yeah. That's always my funnest fact to tell people. There was all this graffiti being like, oh, Caesar might have conquered this place, but Nicomedes conquered him uh, type of thing, which is just silly, but I just think it's funny. And people are always like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, it's a, it's a good conversation starter. <laughs> well, you know, Caesar was basically a ladies man, but he was ambitious and, you know. <laughs> That's one way of saying it. <laughs> is it plausible that he would do what um, but he had to, sure, yeah. Winding this conversation down slightly, as I'm very aware of the time, this is a book from a few years ago, so I'm quite behind on my reading. As I said before we started recording, I am currently reading Salamis, so I'm very behind. I'm going in the wrong order. Uh, but we'll get there in the end, because you just uh, published a new book, which is The War That Made the Roman Empire. So can you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. The sub. Thank you. The War That Made the Roman Empire and subtitle is Antony, Cleopatra and Octavian at Actium. And as in the death of Caesar and Salamis, I'm looking at an incident and going in two directions, both before it and after it, but the ripples that it had and the things that lead, led up to it. So I'm looking at September 2nd, 31 uh, BC, which is the date of the Battle of Actium off the west coast of Greece. This really decisive naval engagement that leaves Octavian uh, as master of the Roman world uh, and Antony and Cleopatra fleeing back to Egypt and fighting, having to fight for their lives, which they lose. They lose their, their power and their lives. So um, I tried to look at, at what really happened, uh, the, uh, the personalities involved. Um, I think it's a really interesting subject because of the work that some of my colleagues and indeed my friends, my people who went to graduate school with me did uh, on the archaeological evidence that tells us a lot about this battle. Uh, evidence that we looked at together in northwestern Greece in October of 1978 when some of it was still literally under bushes and overgrown and they've made fantastic career studying this and learning from it uh, but also because of my own work in, in military history and my interest in unconventional warfare and the things I learned when I was a uh, visiting professor at the Naval Postgraduate School uh, in Monterey, California uh, working with Navy SEALs and others um, not so much for the Battle of Actium, but the lead up for the Battle of Actium uh, and just the incredible personalities involved. Cleopatra again, Antony, Octavian, Agrippa uh, and Herod, who shows up like a bad penny, uh, uh, Nicholas Damascus and all that, but but plays a pretty significant role in everything that went on. Um, and also it took place in Greece, which is my first love of ancient lands. And it gave me an excuse to go back there as well. So I'm so excited to read that book. Can't wait to get my hands on it. Uh, but since we are running out of time, the way I end all of these interviews is actually by asking for a piece of advice from you to the viewers, because the people who watch my channel are newbies. You know, this might be their only sort of engagement with you outside of your books. Guys, description below, you can find all of them. Uh, but the piece of advice that I want to ask from you is people who've watched all the way to the end and they've listened to us chit chat about Caesar, a little bit about Augustus, and they're thinking, okay, now what? Like, how do I keep learning about this outside of this great book? What can I do? How can I go about it? What's the advice that you would give to that person? Great question. My first and simplest piece of advice is to read. It's really important to read. That's what that's what you need to do. I know that young people today don't like to read so much, especially, let's face it, young men, young women are much better. Uh, but young women like to read fiction on the whole, not so much nonfiction. Um, you got to read. Uh, in spite of, uh, podcasts are great, and I'm grateful to be on your, 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 your podcast, but um, uh, reading is the most important thing. So that's that's my advice. If you're interested in Caesar, read Caesar. If you're interested in Roman politics, read Cicero, um, read Plutarch, read Suetonius. 
Uh, but you need to get your hands dirty. You need to read it and decide for yourself. If you can read it in the original language, well, all the better. But you don't have to. There, there are terrific English translations um, nowadays. So, so read. That's my advice. Professor Strauss, as much as I would love to continue this conversation, we are coming up to the end of our time. I'm aware that you have a very busy day. Um, so again, thank you so much for giving me even a moment. I, I hugely, hugely appreciate it. And I cannot say that enough. Uh, but also thank you guys for watching these videos. Thank you guys for engaging with this content. Obviously, that means the absolute world. Uh, and it, I'm sure it means the world to both of us uh, that you guys actually do engage and enjoy this content. So, of course, as I've been saying throughout the video, you guys will be able to find the links to The Death of Caesar, as well as some of the other books that we have mentioned in the description below. Along with, I have linked a video actually on YouTube, which is a lecture that Professor Strauss gave a few years ago specifically on this topic goes into a lot of detail uh, regarding the source material, the archaeological stuff uh, from Rome. I would highly recommend watching that. It's about an hour long. Um, it's fantastic. So you guys can find all of that in the uh, description below. But thank you guys so much, and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.